I wait a few more minutes, Julia, I still see some folks are dialing in. I'm glad you're dialed in and I think I hear you pretty well. Can you say sure. something? There you go. All right, awesome. Can you hear me well? Okay, perfect. Yeah. I see some folks dialing from Canada and obviously from the US and uh, and some in Germany as well. So oh, okay. give them another minute or so. Great. How's the weather here today? Oh, it's really, really nice. It's sunny and warm and yeah, just spring in the air. <laughs> oh. How about you? Pretty good today as well. Yeah, not bad for a morning, so. Okay. Very good. All right, so let's go ahead and get started. I'm gonna ask you to turn your webcam off and then we'll we'll begin the uh, webinar. Sure. All right. Well, good morning, everyone out of Washington, DC. Thank you for joining our webinar today. I do hope you see my screen. It looks like you should be seeing my screen. Um, you've joined uh, one of our uh, webinars uh, focused on the healthcare sector and the international market inside, obviously for Germany. Uh, today's webinar, we'll look at uh, the Digital Care Act, which was passed recently in Germany, as well as market trends and opportunities. Uh, I'm Omar Oweis. Um, I work for Germany Trade Invest out of the Washington, D.C. office, and I'll be your moderator today. And um, give you a little bit of background about our agency. So Germany Trade Invest is the economic development agency for Germany. Uh, we have about 300 employees and we're spread out over 40 different offices worldwide, as you can see. And um, <clears throat> we do have two headquarters in Germany, Berlin and Bonn, uh, which are uh, um, obviously bolded here. And there's a reason for that. Again, our mandate is uh, twofold. On one, on one hand, we help German companies by providing them with uh, export promotion and showcasing international exporting uh, markets and locations for them to help them succeed internationally. But on the flip side, we also help international companies um, with our investor consulting division or investment promotion agency. And that's the side I'm on and my colleague Julia as well, who you briefly saw. And here, obviously, we showcase Germany as a business and investment location. And we, show, we highlight it, showcase it, and we help companies uh, who are considering European expansion, uh, hopefully choose Germany. We have uh, all sorts of uh, market and industry analysis. So uh, obviously we have a healthcare team, but we also have a chemical team, an automotive, machinery, software. So uh, whatever your service is, uh, we obviously have uh, an industry team dedicated to that. Uh, we can help with market entry analysis and uh, you know, showcase who are some of the uh, the competitors in your space in Germany and in Europe, for that matter. We provide uh, extensive legal information on uh, corporate tax rates, um, uh, labor law as well in Germany, what you would expect and what you would need to get started. Uh, we can highlight uh, funding and financing uh, information as well. Uh, see if you're eligible for a type of grant, for example, a research and development grant um, in some cases. And last but not least, of course, we do provide the site selection support, um, classic economic development. We hope that you uh, select a, uh, a site in Germany, of course. I am joined today uh, by two speakers, um, my colleague, uh, Ms. Julia Peach, um, out of our Berlin headquarters. Uh, she is also on the investment uh, promotion side, uh, as I am, and she's a senior manager uh, for the digital health uh, field. Um, on the healthcare team as well. And I will hand over the rights to her in just a second, but I just want to briefly mention, we also have one other speaker, Ms. Julia Hagen, uh, the Director of a Regulatory and Politics at the HIH, or the Health Innovation Hub, also dialed in from Berlin, uh, Germany today. So at this point, uh, I would like to hand over the rights to Julia, my colleague, and um, I look forward to her presentation. Thank you so much. Thank you, Omar. So I can hand over now. So you should see my screen now. Yes, and I, I see you your screen. also hear me. And I hear you loud and clear. It's all okay. yours. Thank you. So yeah, hello everybody. Also from my side, um, happy to be here today. Um, before we take a closer look um, at the Digital Care Act, 
I will start with a general overview about uh, Germany's healthcare market. So let's start with some of the um, some of the um, facts and figures about the German healthcare market. In the year 2017, we already spend more than 1 billion euros a day per day on healthcare. So that amounted to 387 billion euros um, healthcare expenditure already. And uh, this accounts for 11.6% of total GDP in Germany. Uh, we have 70 million people with public health insurance and 9 million people with private health insurance. And we have a little less than 2,000 hospitals in Germany with more than 500,000 beds. And healthcare is also an important and large um, yeah, job market in Germany. As you can see here, 7 million people are employed in the German healthcare industry. So, as said before, uh, we have the, the vast majority in Germany has public health insurance. Um, health insurance is mandatory in, in Germany, and uh, we achieve almost universal health insurance coverage. We have 44 private health insurance companies and 105 public health insurance companies that you can that you can choose to. About 10% um, uh, in Germany have private health insurance. Again, our nearly 2,000 hospitals are either public, private, or charity-based. And as you can see here on the right-hand side, um, yeah, there is some heavy privatization going on in the hospital market. We have uh, more and more hospitals that are privately owned. Um, yeah, and if you if you are interested in more statistics about the hospital market, uh, yeah, please let us know. We have uh, much more information on this available. In Germany, as in many other countries in Europe, we are facing some tough challenges in healthcare, of course. Um, as you might know, Germany is a really old population, um, so to say. We are already the oldest population in Europe, in Europe and the second oldest population worldwide after Japan. With that, of course, more challenges come along. So we have an increasing number of people that are care dependent that are taking taking um, care of in, in homes, in home care, or in inpatient care. And we also have more people with chronic diseases, with multiple diseases at the same time. So yeah, some quite, quite some tough challenges uh, to, to face here. And I think it's no, it's no secret that digital health can help to face some of these challenges at least. So look at the digital health market. Um, the market volume is predicted to grow um, heavily, as you can see here. In Germany, the digital health market is predicted to grow to 80, no, 38 billion euros to 2025. And if you wonder why, why do we see this, this heavy growth? Well, German patients are already used to using digital health applications, but most of them are paid paid by out of pocket. And this is uh, going to change. So we have already remote treatment, for example. Uh, we have a lot of teleconsultation companies in Germany and also uh, coming from Switzerland, from Austria, but also from the Scandinavian countries, from the Netherlands. Uh, we do also have e-prescription in Germany. So there are some health insurance companies that offer those services for their customers. And we also have the electronic patient record. But we don't have a nationwide rollout yet. So not every insured person can make use of these applications. And this is going to change. The Digital Healthcare Act was implemented to improve care with these digital health applications. And I would now like to highlight some of the uh, points 
or um, yeah, points that are in, in that law. So first of all, every insured member will have access to an electronic health record. By 2021, every member of a public health insurance must have access to such a patient record. At the same time, teleconsultation will be strengthened. And now with the corona crisis, we already see a growth in uh, demand uh, of these services in Germany and how, yeah, in the light of corona, there is even a boom in telemedicine in Germany. Another really important point is the improved access to patient data for, re for research purposes. So public health insurance companies will have to send their anonymized member demographics and health data to a central database. And research organizations and universities can then request that data for research purposes. And when it comes to money, there's also um, something in that law. So for those of you who are not familiar with the innovation fund that will be um, strengthened and, and uh, expanded, in 2016, it was already set up as the so-called innovation fund to further develop the quality of care in Germany. And the idea was to financially support new types of care as well as care research projects, which are not yet part of the standard care or statutory care. And this fund will be extended until 2025, no, 2024, I'm sorry, with 2 million euros per year. So health insurance companies can support need-based and patient-oriented development of digital innovation. And the next point, also really, really interesting, doctors will be allowed to prescribe medical apps. So as I said, many patients already use specific apps to manage their medication intake or record their blood, blood sugar, for example. And with this new Digital Care Act, the doctors will be allowed to prescribe medical apps and, and, and other applications paid by the public health insurance. Um, and there will be a so-called fast track to bring those applications faster into, into standard care. And Julia Hagen will now dig deeper into this past track and will explain to you how it will work. With that, I leave you with my contact information if you have questions about um, my presentation or further questions. Um, yeah, wait till the end so we have more time for questions, but you can also write me an email or give me a call after the presentation. And with that, Omar, I will hand over to you again. Thank you. Wonderful, Julia. Thank you. Wonderful as always. You did a great job. Now let me do the screen share one second. All right. Bear with me. There we go. All right. Uh, Julia, thank you so much. We actually did have a question uh, already pop up. Uh, someone was asking uh, whether or not the slides will be available. And yes, of course. Uh, we will make those uh, slides available. Sure. Uh, they they did find the um, the chat feature here to post questions, which I'm, I'm really glad they did. Uh, you are not we will not interrupt any of the speakers at any given time, so feel free to to post your questions. And following Julia Hagen's presentation, we will have uh, an interactive Q and A session as well. So please post your questions at any given moment. Without further ado, um, we'll uh, briefly introduce our second speaker, uh, Ms. Julia Hagen. As I briefly mentioned, uh, she's the Director of Regulatory and Politics at the HIH, or the Health Innovation Hub, which is part of the Federal Ministry of Health in Berlin. And I look forward to Julia Hagen's presentation as well. I'll send her over the rights right now. And we'll let her do that. Wonderful. Okay. Thank you, Omar. Thank you for the kind introduction. I'll give it a try. Welcome, everyone. So, well, I hear you, you should be seeing my screen now. Clear, so. Thank you. Go ahead. It's all yours. Perfect. So, thank you. Thank you all for your patience. Uh, thank you for sticking with us. Um, so, as Omar said, I work for um, the Health Innovation Hub. We are the federal 
health ministries think tank on digitalization in healthcare. We've been set up in um, April 2019 by the health minister. He's uh, um, in the picture at the bottom of the, of the slide. Uh, we are a small team of uh, 12 um, experts from different uh, fields, hospital care, ambulant care, data related, um, data privacy related expertise, interoperability, health technology assessment, um, all kind of aspects that you uh, would want to have in a team when you want to work on the framework for digital health in, in Germany. So we have been set up in April last year and we will consult the ministry until end of um, 2021. So we are a temporary project of the, of the health ministry, sort of an experiment if you want. We, we work on all kinds of different, different topics. Um, one of the, the main um, points we worked on, especially in the last year, was um, the Digital Care Act and the new framework for the reimbursement of digital health applications. And that's what I'm going to talk to you, um, uh, what I'm going to talk about today. Besides, we work on issues related to artificial intelligence um, in healthcare. We work on data privacy related reforms. We work a lot on interoperability, on um, terminology, etc. And um, we also try to work on digitalization in the field of elderly care, which is a very um, a, a very complicated topic on its on its own. But today we want to focus on questions related to um, digital health applications. So until 2020, um, in in Germany, we did have a few digital health applications that found their way successfully by muddling through. Um, um, they found their they found their way into the system, and um, until until 2020, so until the the law has been passed, there was not a specific path for digital health solutions to be integrated into the system. You see all these different paragraphs. Um, they're from the social code, and they open up small small paths that can be used to um, to see your product reimbursed by the statutory health insurance but it's all very fragmented and um, it's very it's very complicated and it's not really made for digital products so many of these um, many of the digital solutions that tried to um, get into the system actually encountered a lot of difficulties when doing so so what we did what well not what we did but what the um, the the government did and the parliament um, is to establish a complete new framework that um, allows physicians uh, to prescribe digital health applications as they are prescribing drugs today or physical therapy or other forms of therapy. I'll try to um, walk you through the, the process and the requirements and to explain what exactly um, does are the, what exactly are the requirements a digital health application does have to meet when it wants to be reimbursed by statutory health insurance? So first of all, we have to ask yourself uh, ask ourselves what exactly do we mean by digital health application? So digital health application in German we um, we came up with uh, the digitale Gesundheitsanwendung. So in short, that's DIGA. So whenever you see DIGA, that stands for digital health application. So they are defined as um, being a medical device um, of a low risk class. So risk class one or two A um, according to medical device regulation. However, of course, all the provisional rules that the medical device regulation um, contains um, are applied. So if you have a medical device that is that benefits from these provisional rules that is class one or two a today it yes may benefit may be eligible for this um, DIGA um, reimbursement track the second aspect is um, the main function of the digital health application so it's um, the law says that the digital health application has to rely 
the, its main function has to rely on digital technologies. So that is where they, where um, the lawmaker is trying to make a difference between other medical devices that are just hardware and do not contain any software, and where the lawmaker also tries to make a difference between um, standard medical devices that just get on top software as an accessory. Um, here it's really about the main function, um, and the main function has to um, be uh, has to be rely on digital technologies. That does not mean that hardware is excluded, um, but uh, it's about the main function. The third aspect is the the intended use. So as I said as I said earlier, the the digital health applications will be prescribed by by doctors. So you have to keep in mind this um, this setting. So the the digital health application is centered. It, 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 the focus is on patients. So it's meant to be used by by patients, but it can possibly include the the treating physicians or the the doctors or other healthcare professionals that are involved. But it's definitely it cannot. Ediga is not a software or a solution that is intended to be used by healthcare professionals only. Like for example. Um, clinical decision support tools. So here it's really about something that a physician can prescribe to um, its patients. So if you know a little bit about the German system, we are mainly talking about um, the um, non-hospital sector, so all the individual uh, physicians in their private practice um, that are prescribing um, therapies and in the, in the near future digital health applications to their patients. There's one exception to that. In the process of um, um, discharge management in the hospital, um, digital health applications can also be prescribed and reimbursed. That's um, one add-on to that. So the last aspect about the, the definition and about what we, understand, what, we, what we define digital health applications by is um, is the function, so the different types of functionalities. These functionalities, the detection, the treatment, the abatement of pain, etc., that are terms that you possibly know from um, um, from medical device, um, from the, from, um, from medical medical product law or medical device regulation. These terms are known, so um, they are, the the functionalities do not list all the possible functionalities of of a medical device. Some of the functionalities are actually excluded in this context. Um, a concrete example um, would be uh, contraception. So it's not possible to introduce a digital health application that, um, that, it's, that, is, um, that, that has a functionality of contraception and to have it reimbursed in this, uh, in this framework. So now that we know what a digital health application is, I assume you would like to know how this this fast track, this DIGA fast track, according to the Digital Care Act, um, how it's how it's working. Um, so we have um, we have a, a optional uh, first step um, that is the consulting and um, information that is provided by the. Um, by the Federal Institute for Medicines and Medical Devices. Um, that's roughly the equi equivalent of the FDA um, in Germany. They are called B Farm in um, in German. So the B Farm, um, our federal agency, is in charge of this process. Um, they offer consulting um, against the fee and support um, applicants in the in, in the process so that their application actually is. Complete and require and, com and complies with the requirements. The um, the manufacturer of a digital health application um, can um, has has to make an application to the federal agency, where the manufacturer asks to register the digital health application in the DIGA registry. That's the registry that will list the digital health applications that are reimbursed by the statutory health insurances. So 90% of the Germans will have access to them. In the, um, in the application, there, there are basically two 
um, two requirements that have to be met, so two sorts of requirements. First of all, they are the general requirements. They are related to safety, quality, functionality, um, data privacy and data security of the, of the product. Many of these aspects will be covered by the CE mark. That is the requirement, as I said earlier, but there are some additional requirements that have to be met. This is the, the very fundamental and basic requirements. If they are not met, um, the digital health applications will not be listed in the DIGA digital health application registry at all. There's a second component, um, the so-called positive care effects. So that's, that's again, it's a new term, something um, the government um, came up with. So it's the idea um, of um, um, improved outcomes in care delivery. Um, so either the digital application, application is able to show medical benefit um, and or to show structural or procedural improvements um, related to, to patients and their, 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 the care they're, they're, they're receiving. So that's the second aspect. In your, um, in your application, in the application, the manufacturers have basically two options. Either they apply and they, met, they meet all the general requirements and they also already have evidence, then they can um, apply for a definitive listing in the digital health application registry. The Bay Farm will, um, will, will check the application within three months and make a final decision. The second version, and that is sort of the revolution in this whole um, system, um, is that you might, you will have, you will be compliant with all the general requirements, but you have not yet the evidence to show your structural and procedural effects and or the medical benefit of your solution. In that case, and that's a real novelty, there's the possibility of a preliminary listing and a 12 month trial period in, in the setting of, of standard care, basically. So what does, what does that mean? So considering the case that you, you met all the basic requirements, but you haven't, um, you haven't collected all the evidence that you would need to be um, definitively listed in the registry. Um, in that case, um, you need to provide the federal agency with a plausible hypothesis of your um, positive care effects and with an evaluation concept that is accompanied by an independent scientific um, institution. All the costs have to be covered by the manufacturer or the producer. With this, with this concept, you then, you then successfully apply um, to the federal agency and they accept to list um, the digital health application for this 12 month trial in the first, so in the statutory health um, healthcare market. So access to the roughly 90% of the German uh, population that is um, insured in this in this setting. During these during these 12 months, the manufacturer sets the price of the digital health solution, and if there are any um, if there's um, if there there's any additional tasks for the physician, um, then also these kind of additional burden for the physician will be reimbursed for the physician um, during these 12 months. During these 12 months, the manufacturer collects data um, and um, will, be, will hopefully be able to show the positive care effects that were claimed in the beginning. After the 12, after the 12 months, the uh, federal agency decides on the final listing if the positive care effects have been proven. After the 12 months, um, the, we will not keep the producer, the manufacturer's price, but um, there will be price negotiations with the umbrella organization of the statutory health insurance, insurance bodies. Um, and between this, between this body and the manufacturer, 
and same um, applies to um, to to additional services possibly provided by the physicians. There as well will be a negotiation between the physicians' um, representatives and again the umbrella organization of the statutory health insurances to define a final price for that kind of um, service that the physician is delivering. When I talk about physicians, um, I'm not being a 100% correct because it's not only physicians, it's not only physicians, but also psychotherapists. I don't know about all the the the, the differences and how how you treat um, physicians versus psychotherapists, etc. In in your countries, but it's um, the psychotherapists in Germany are able to also prescribe digital health applications, and we see quite a few digital health applications um, emerging. Um, uh, or having emerged the last the last year in the field of mental health, so um, that will definitely definitely be um, an important um, case. In addition to the possibility that physicians and psychotherapists prescribe digital health applications during the 12 months, but also after that, um, there's also the possibility that um, the statutory health insurances. Um, actually um, provide their their clients, so to say, with the digital health application. Given um, given the, the given the fact that the that I can show to my um, health insurance that I had actually that I have actually been diagnosed with this disease and um, that is justified to uh, give me that kind of uh, digital health application. So just con that, that's, that's a case that will most likely apply to, to chronically, chronically ill. So if I were, if I were a diabetes, diabetes patient, my health insurance of course would know that I'm, I'm, I'm diagnosed with diabetes and then they can provide me, offer me digital health applications that help me um, with um, helping dealing with my diabetes on a daily basis, for example, it's just a random example. So now let's have a look at a bit more at those requirements. Um, so I talked to you about those general requirements um, and um, I mentioned the, um, the positive care effects. Um, that's the general requirements are, um, are the basic requirements as I said, most of them, especially safety, functionality, and quality, most of that is covered by the CE mark. There are some additional requirements regarded, regarding consumer protection, um, um, but they are all listed in um, the regulation that is currently being finalized by the health ministry. And there's the second, um, the second box here in the light blue box, um, that's the privacy, the data privacy, and the data IT security requirements. There, of course, as you are all very well aware, where data privacy is a very sensitive issue in Germany, so there are a couple of requirements. Basically, of course, it's GDPR with some um, very few additional requirements. When it comes to the positive care effects, um, then there are two. Then we are distinguishing two type of um, positive care effects. So the, the medical benefit, so an improved clinical outcome, that is definitely something that you all know very well. So um, um, we will just have a quick look at that later. But the other aspect is um, the structural and the procedural um, improvements. And that is something new that has been introduced um, with this Digital uh, Care Act. Um, the positive care effects, um, as I said, two types of positive care effects. The medical benefit, um, increased quality of life, reduced mobility, reduced mortality. That's pretty straightforward. Um, the, there's a lot of research and there are a lot of established um, frameworks to assess these kind of medical benefits for different types of uh, conditions. So we're very familiar with that. On the other hand, there are the new um, structural and procedural effects that we want um, the we and the, the the government and the parliament want to see included in the evaluation of digital health applications. 
and here's here's some of the some examples of what kind of um, what kind of ideas lie behind this very abstract and not very yeah not very easy to understand term structural and procedural um, effects so it's about the reduction of a burden of illness in daily life it's about securing that the standard of care that um, medical guidelines are respected um, it might be about the coordination of care making sure that in transition from different types of care there um, there are no gaps just an example it might be about the access to care about health literacy adherence or patient safety and this is definitely not um, the list is not complete there there are possible there are many more possible um, ideas and so for these um, for these aspects there um, there we still there we will still need more research to actually understand what kind of concepts and methodological approaches we can use to assess these effects but the um, the the government um, wanted to include these um, these other side of um, more indirect effects that of course will eventually have an effect on medical um, medical benefits um, as well and wanted to include them in this this procedure let me just go back for for a quick um, quick um, add-on to that the what you will all be most interested in is now what are the exact requirements in terms of the evidence that needs to be delivered and that is something that is currently being um, finalized in a regulation by the federal health ministry the regulation is expected to be published um, around the time around easter roughly and then we will know what kind of study design will be required what we know now from the draft regulation that has been published is that most likely the um, the, the federal agency will require to do um, to conduct a a comparative trial. Um, so we are in a not the highest level of um, of evidence, but a rather top middle level of, of evidence but we want um, but we're waiting to see the final version of the text to then actually know what kind of um, level of evidence will be required and then um, and then the federal agency is um, it's already working on a guideline that will um, detail even more all the requirements that the federal ministry has been specifying in the regulation in order to um, to make these requirements a bit less abstract and easy more e easier to to grasp and and to understand and then we expect the first applications to um, be able to be treated by may given the circumstances may might become a bit complicated right now as you are very well aware priorities are shifting right now but for now we are still optimistic about may and if you add three months to may you end up in august roughly so let's say august or september third um, um well sort of the third quarter of, of, of the year we will definitely see the first digital health applications in in germany being prescribed by doctors and um, used by by patients so that would be it from for now from from my part i assume there might be a couple of questions i'm very happy to answer um answer your questions and i hope you were able um to get an idea of this new fast track for digital health applications thank you very much julia hagen thank you very much this is omar again um we did actually have a few questions that just came up and they were um obviously in relation to your presentation uh, which was the one we heard the best so far uh, again i apologize for the technical difficulties i'm going to pose those questions right now julia if you don't mind just keep you on the line mm -hmm. um and sure. i'm also not going to use my webcam i did see some comments saying that that may have thrown some things up so anyway um, someone, uh, Michael, uh, Michael asked, I think you said that prescribed digital health app during hospital discharge is not eligible. Is that correct? And why? No, it is, it is eligible. Um, it is eligible. It is eligible. So it's, 
I don't I don't know how well you're aware of the 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 mechanism um, in in hospital versus ambulant um, um, private practice setting in Germany. They have they have very different um, reimbursement um, mechanisms, and usually in hospital such a digital health application would just be part of the the the, the DRGs the D disease related groups. Um, but there's the exception, the explicit exception um, in the hospital setting for the discharge um, management. So, um, and that would be something um, that could be very well related to the um, the example of a, a procedural improvement um, in the field of uh, coordination of care, coordination, coordinating the the care between um, between a hospital and um, and I don't know, um, uh, physio, uh, physiotherapy and GP uh, after a certain kind of um, of surgery, for example. So there might be these kind of cases. Thank you, Julia. Another question here: Will the B Farm publish the results of the assessments exactly after three months, or can B Farm decide already after two months? Thank you for coming for that question. Um, they can. Well, they they won't they won't publish the results. They will give you they will give feedback to the manufacturer. That's the first thing. So, so they won't publish uh, publicly the uh, the results of the application. Um, and yes, they, they they may be quicker. Definitely, um, it's usually in um, usually you only have to decide the upper limit, uh, and then you can be very sure that it um, it's. It, it might, it won't take too long. But yes, they could, they could in theory decide after a month. Um, Thank you, Julia. We'll do one more question and then um, we'll try to give Julia Peach one more chance and get to a uh, general Q&A at the very end. Um, uh, Pateri asked, uh, is it possible for certain well-established or proven solutions to enter straight into the 12, 12 month standard care period? And if not approved, the timescale will be 12 months trial plus 12 months standard care, resulting in 20, 24 months total. Is that correct? Um, no. So you, if you have a well-established product uh, that has the evidence, you might apply to. You may apply. apply oh, oh my God! You may apply to the to the B farm um, to be finally listed um, at, at, in, in the DIGA registry. And then there's no no limitation. You will not be kicked out after 24 months or 36 or anything. Then you are listed, um, and the product can be prescribed and reimbursed uh, by uh, statutory health insurances. So only if the, the the digital health application does not is not able to show the evidence yet, then you might go for the 12 month preliminary preliminary. Um, um, period, and then after that 12 month, um, there will be a decision if the DIGA is listed finally and definitively. I hope this you, answers Julia. the question. I think so. And again, there are a couple more have popped up, but we'll get to that maybe at the very end as well. Thank you, Julia, again. Um, Julia Hagen. Julia Peach, uh, do you want to show a few more slides? I, I would not recommend going through the entire presentation at this time for the sake of time. Um, but if you'd like, we could give that a, another shot. You let me know. Sure. Can you hear me already? I hear you best. <laughs> Perfect. All right. Okay. Then, yeah, I start um, all over again. And uh, my presentation was, ex was actually intended to give you an overall, um, yeah, an introduction of the, the healthcare system in Germany. So I will just um, go through some of the slides here so we are all on the same page. Um, and yeah, I already showed you some of the slides. I think you you saw uh, you saw some of the figures that, that didn't understand what I was saying. So I just briefly go through this again. So I already talked about how much we spend on healthcare in Germany. It's uh, more than 380 billion that was in 2018, so that was 1 billion a day on healthcare, accounting for 11.6% of total GDP. So 
Yeah, we have um, two. We have 72 million, um, people, 72 million people in public health insurance, and um, Julia talked about it um, as well. Um, these are the, the your clients that you can then tackle when you come into the statutory health insurance, the standard care, as we sometimes uh, say. Um, we have nearly 2,000 hospitals, 500,000 beds. Um, and as said before, we also, um, healthcare is also a, a large, um, a large uh, job market in, in Germany. Okay. I cannot click again, but now it's working. And, um, I already showed you, um, this slide about health insurance in Germany and health insurance coverage, coverage in Germany. It is mandatory, as I said before. And the vast majority has public health insurance. Um, I also showed you this slide already. And um, if you are interested in more statistics on hospitals, we have a lot more. Um, let us know. Uh, we can provide a lot more about also the hospital market in Germany. Um, as in other European countries in Germany, we are facing some heavy uh, demographic challenges. We are really old population in Germany, meaning that we are already the oldest population in Europe and the second oldest population in the world after Japan. With that, of course, more um, challenges come along. We have a lot more people that are care dependent, that are taking care of in home care or in inpatient care. We have more people with chronic diseases, also more people with multiple diseases at the same time. And as most of you, I guess, are digital experts, uh, digital health experts, or um, at least know the meaning, understand the meaning of digital health, I don't have to explain to you how digital health can help to face some of these um, healthcare challenges. And in Germany, we understood that digital health can do that. And we see that the market is really dynamic. Uh, we see a growth in the market volume of digital health. Here you see um, the prediction of the market volume through 2025. And um, yeah, so there is uh, there is a growth uh, that we can see. And now the question is, why, why is there? Why do we see that growth? Um, well, in Germany, we already have, and Julia mentioned that, we already have digital health applications like remote treatment. We have e-prescription. We do have electronic patient records. But we have them in islands, meaning that there are a lot of examples of hospitals that are uh, using digital solutions, of course. In the north of Germany, we have a paperless hospital. We have a smart hospital. Um, we do have multiple providers of telemedicine services and um, e-consultation services in Germany. And we do have public health insurance companies that offer e-prescription or an electronic patient record for their clients. But again, we don't have a nationwide rollout yet. So not every patient, not every insured person in Germany has access to that yet. And this is what is going to change with the Digital Care Act or the Digital Health Care Act. And it was implemented, it was passed last year to improve care with digital health applications. Um, the DIGAS that Julia, Julia also, also talked about. And, um, yeah, I mean, you heard of uh, all of the things that are in the, in the law and that, that will, uh, come into being. Um, so there will be an access for electronic health record for every insured, um, person. Um, Teleconsultation will be strengthened, and especially in um, the current situation uh, we see in Germany, um, that teleconsultation makes a lot of sense to keep people um, out of um, out of the doctor's offices. And um, even before the the Corona crisis here, we saw that a lot of teleconsultation providers from different countries, from Switzerland, from Austria from the Netherlands, from uh, um, the Scandinavian company uh, countries um, that they um, expanded to the German market and um, offered their services to the German uh, German customers here as well as um, the market is, is opening up 
um, in, in general for telemedicine in Germany. Um, of course, um, it's also important to get access to patient data. And in the law, it says that um, the, the public health insurance companies, they will, um, they will provide their um, anonymous member demographics and health data to a central database so that then research organizations and universities can request access to this data for health uh, purposes. So this is also new. And talking about money, the Health Innovation Fund will also um, be extended. For those of you who are not familiar with that, in 2016, the German government set up the so-called Innovation Fund to further develop um, the quality of care. And the idea behind it was to financially su support new types of care, as well as care research projects, which are not yet part of standard care or statutory health care. And this innovation fund will extend, will be extended until 2024 with 200 million euros per year. And uh, with that, health insurance companies can, can support um, need-based and patient-oriented development of digital innovation. Um, and last but not least, and this is where Julia digs deep into uh, what that means, doctors will be allowed to prescribe medical apps, for example, and that can be reimbursed. So you see there are a lot of things where you can, uh, where you can tackle the German market and um, uh, uh, try and get into the reimbursement scheme in Germany. And um, yeah, we're happy to, to answer your questions now. And as I said, if you have questions, later on or need more on this, uh, please, please let us know. You have our contact information as well here. Thank you so much. Julia, thank you. Um, it was a night and day difference with, uh, with your sound at that one time. So I'm glad you were able to dial in. I have to do the same as well. <laughs> All right. Um, we're going to take a few more questions. We uh, are uh, nearing the end of our hour, but uh, there were a couple more questions. I'm going to just uh, get right to it. Um, will there be a public comment period on the acceptable designs guidance? There's a question. I think it was in relation to Julia Hagen's um, presentation. Will there be a public comment period on the acceptable designs guidance? Anyone want to um, shout out to that that's, um, that's up to the Federal Agency for Drugs and Medicine. So I'm um, I'm not aware if they have made a final decision. Given the fact that the whole process has been, for now, has been rather um, participatory, um, and the BFAM, as especially those of you who maybe are from Germany or have been in exchange with the BFAM already, um, they're, they're very open. So I think it's likely that they will at least ask for feedback. Definitely. But there's no so there's no legal obligation for a consultation or anything like that. Gotcha. Thank you, Julia. Um, somebody asked, uh, can we set up a call with Bee Farm if we are in early stage, in the early stages of creating our regulatory strategy that's possible in Germany? Um, yes, you can. There's, if you go on the website of the bee farm, you can um, ask for an appointment with the Innovationsbüro, the innovation office. And um, depending on if you actually need um, need a session or if you just have a couple of questions, then you want to get answers to um, it will be either for free or you will be charged a, a, a fee on sort of um, to, to cover the expenses on, on bee farm side um, as they are a public body. Um, but that's definitely definitely possible. They also consult on is my digital product a medical device or isn't it? Great, thank you. Another question here: At which time in point? Uh, I'm sorry. At which time in the process will it be possible to start the price negoci negotiations with GKV KG, uh, GKV SV after 12 months of the approval or earlier? Um, after the 12 month of um, uh, of trial period, trial period. Okay. because well because they need because B, B farm what is what is happening is B farm is assessing 
BFM is, is making the binary decision, yes or no, the digital health application is included in the registry and is then going to be reimbursed. BFM doesn't decide anything about price. That's why during the first 12 months, the manufacturer sets a price and um, the 12 month, at the end of the 12 month, the, um, um, the BFM makes a final decision. Is the evidence sufficient or not? And if that's the case, they sort of hand over the whole dossier, the whole case to the um, umbrella organization of the statutory health insurances, the GKV, SV, and then um, price negotiations will start right after the 12 month. Thank you. Um, do applications need to be ordered by mobile application shop like Google Play? Mm, no. Um, so a digital health application may be a native app, but it may also be a web application or something complete different. Um, it does not have to be um, a native app and it doesn't, of course it will then, I assume if it's a native app, be made available via Google or Apple um, app stores. Uh, and we are in very constructive exchanges and uh, we're being, having very constructive constru exchanges with Google and Apple Play Store. App Store and Play Store um, to make sure that everything's um, fine on, on both sides regarding the native native apps, digital health applications. But we will we expect also to see a couple of um, web um, based digital health applications. Thank you. Um, is there more information available on the legislation and future practice of people accessing their medical data? Follow up, will there be an API for applications to access that data? Julia, do you want to answer? Should I answer? <laughs> okay, Julia doesn't. <laughs> Doesn't I seem to you, want to. Um, <laughs> so let me go ahead, yeah. go ahead Julia Hagen. Um, so I, I assume I assume this is okay. Julia Peach can't hear us anymore, apparently. All right. Um, so I assume this question is about the um, the the database Julia Peach mentioned. Um, so the 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 infrastructure and the governance are being set up um, are still being set up. Um, so I can't tell you um, what kind of API um, um, they will they will set up, and uh, but I hope um, I'm very confident that they will set up a, a, a smooth process because this whole reform um, of this uh, database for the for that that kind of claims data um, was in response to an existing claims data database that we have had for more than 10 years but that has not been working very well and when research teams would ask for data it would happen regularly that they would wait for four years or three years to even get feedback so that's why um there why there's a team working on how to set up how to set this up properly and we're even getting in touch with the french because they're setting up the health data hub and um, we are starting we are starting to see what we can learn from each other and how we can maybe set this up in a similar way so that there will be some synergies on a European level. It doesn't mean that we will start exchanging data between France and Germany very soon because that would all be super complicated uh, probably um, in terms of data privacy law, but at least we're starting to coordinate um, action. Great, thank you. Um, someone asked, can you define independent scientific institution for the evaluations? Does this include private companies that conduct research on data, or must it be investigators initiated at a research institution? It's basically the same rules that apply um, to to how um, how drugs um, are being assessed in in Germany. So in that case, you may very well collaborate with a private research organization as long as this research organization is independent from your organization. Great, thank you. Uh, we'll do one more question and then um, uh, do the final uh, comments poll. 
um, when Julia mentioned, I guess the question is which Julia, <laughs> the availability of health data for universities and research institutions, will the EPR vendors be forced to make data available? The Can what vendors? The yeah, Julia. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Um, from what I understand, it's about the health insurance companies um, that make their demographic um, data and their um, the, their public health uh, data available for um, for research uh, purposes only. So it's not, of course, for everybody. And um, the, as I understood it, Julia, you can correct me if I'm if I'm wrong. There will be a platform um, or a central database by the German government that will manage that. So yeah. Exactly. Yes. Exactly. Great. Well, thank you first of all to uh, to our audience. <laughs> you were very patient with us during a very challenging webinar. This, uh, I have to say, was the most difficult one uh, to date. Um, I would like to submit a quick poll, um, or at least a survey, um, at least Katrin, my colleague, will do that or will email it to you. Um, a couple of questions came up, whether we can send around this recording. Of course we can send around this recording, but I don't believe it has been a very good one. Um, but we will send around all presentations and all the contact information for our two wonderful speakers. You did a fantastic job uh, in, in, in very challenging times and in a very challenging webinar. Um, we have a couple more questions that did come in. We can answer those privately as well. I want to respect everyone's time. And I want to thank both Julia Hagen and Julia Peach and my colleague in the background, Katrin, who has been uh, uh, very helpful in making this uh, come together as best as it could. So um, if there's any final words from either Julia, go ahead while we can hear you. Otherwise, I wish you all a, a wonderful day. Thank you, Omar. That was a wonderful, wonderful job. Thank you so much. And thank you, Julia, for, for doing this for us. A wonderful presentation. Thank you. Thanks to everybody. Thank you. One more, one more thing I just was reminded. Um, you will all receive an email um, with a double opt-in uh, requirement if you would like to join our future upcoming webinars. Um, so please remember to double up in, um, it is a GDPR guideline, um, and we of course uh, hope you'll join us for future webinars. Thank you very much, well. thank you again, stay healthy and all the best. Bye-bye. Thank you, bye. Thank you, bye-bye.